like to begin um, by talking about uh, what it is uh, that the that the state uh, thinks. This is the 2018 adoption, uh, which is a a slight improvement over the one that I had to work with, um, but the but, but it's still a long way from from being um, or, or representing. Uh, what I think would be a better way of, of uh, looking at um, the part of Texas history before the Republic. And, and it still goes, uh, and it goes to one of the fundamental issues that we have with Texas history, and that is that, that focus on the 19th century, um, which is, um, as some of you may be familiar uh, with T.R. Fehrenbach's book, uh, which represented um, a very um, stilted, uh, a very Anglo-centric, uh, a very romantic um, way of looking at uh, Texas history. And um, in fact, um, he didn't have very much or, or much good to say about what happened before Anglo-Americans arrived. And he doesn't really have very much um, to say about what happens in the 20th century because it's not important. It's not Texas history anymore uh, from his perspective. So we don't have, um, so essentially there's this, this romantic version of Texas history that, that people latched onto in the course of the 20th century and has remained there. And it, and it has a very limited roles uh, for both uh, Tejanos and for, um, Native Americans, uh, for the indigenous peoples of Texas, and, and, for, and for Blacks. Um, and that, thankfully, is all changing. Um, and uh, due to some really important works uh, beginning in the 1990s uh, that started to uh, look at uh, the, the experiences of these uh, other groups that had been sort of marginalized or even excluded from the story, um, and including uh, works of people participating in, in this uh, webinar. Um, Todd uh, yesterday, uh, Andrew uh, coming up, um, and others. Um, Steve uh, Harden, for instance, his uh, 1990s look at the Texas Revolution was the first one to really talk about the role that Tejanos played and their influence on the way uh, battles were were fought and how the armies conducted themselves. So, um, and he paid good attention to the Mexican side of the story. So, for all those reasons, we're 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 moving away from the from a very narrow focus to a broader one, and that's good. Um, and the the standards still don't reflect that because, as you can see here, uh, this this. Um, uh, the one that covers the period um, is actually one that covers everything that happens from the time that Cabeza de Vaca arrived all the way through the end of the Mexican period, and it's all covered in this one uh, standard. And and um, that's unfortunate. Um, and if if we had more balance, I think we could cover this material better in, in the course of the year. So let's get let's get going with uh, that as the introduction and begin with. Um, uh, why aren't we? There we go. Um, defining the Tejano uh, and Mexican American. So the geography of northern Mexico. Um, and here, um, what we have is um, a map that uh, one of many produced in the 1830s and early 1840s, um, which um, are increasingly accurate, but they're not quite there yet. Uh, but I chose this one um, because I think it's one that you can take to students. And by the way, this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation will be uploaded uh, to the Google Classroom site afterwards. And so you can actually pull out the images and whatnot that you'd like to use in class if you like. Um, what, um, what I want to point out here is that um, although there are a lot of lines on this map, um, and there seem to be a great many boundaries. Um, people really weren't sure about what was what and what was where and what belonged to whom. Um, this was all still being sorted out. There weren't any uh, satellites. There wasn't GPS. Uh, there wasn't um, modern uh, surveying techniques. So um, things underground, 
Uh, and many parts of what's on this map uh, weren't even uh, explored or visited uh, by uh, uh, Euro-Americans. They had only, uh, they were the homeland of various Indian groups, which you can actually see on, represented on the map. Um, and so uh, Tejanos are living in a world that is still a frontier over a hundred years after they've arrived on the scene. And the reason for that, um, as uh, I'm sure that uh, Will Fowler will, will discuss uh, tomorrow during his presentation, was that um, the uh, Texas was a remote and outside corner of things. It wasn't the center of the Mexican universe, even during the colonial period. Um, things were happening in the rest of Mexico um, the, which is where the population center was, where the economic center was, where the political center was, and, and Texas was a, a periphery. And it had remained in a frontier state um, for over a century with only three areas of, of settlement. And the, so the Tejano population is actually small um, and isolated and isolated from each other. So there is a Tejano population around San Antonio, uh, which gets its start in 1718 with the founding of, the, of um, a um, uh, mission San Antonio de Valero, what becomes the Alamo, and um, the Presidio. Um, then there is a second population center, which is at around what is now Matagorda Bay um, from the area that um, from the coast, near the coast, all the way up to Victoria and Goliad, and which in the Mexican period will actually develop two separate communities, Victoria and Goliad, but is known as La Bahia during the colonial period. And that population center there gets started in the early 1720s and has moved a couple of times. We don't need to get into all of that. By the Mexican period, uh, Goliad, uh, which is still being called La Bahia, is a presidio and mission um, settlement um, in, um, in what is today um, uh, Goliad, uh, but it was called La Bahia and it was supposed to be defending the, the, uh, the coastal area. And then the other one is up in the northeast and it's actually um, a uh, trans, what we would now call a trans-border settlement because the original capital of Texas uh, was actually, uh, is actually now a, um, a state historic park in Louisiana. Uh, right outside Robeline, Louisiana is a Los Adai state historic site, uh, and it was the original capital of Texas. Um, it was lost to Texas as a result of the negotiations of the Adams and East Treaty of 1819, um, but the population by then was living in the area around Nacogdoches to the west. And again, we don't have time to get into um, all of the uh, nuts and bolts of how that happened. But the important thing to, to remember is that um, there's, a, there's a good, there's, four, there's 400 miles between San Antonio and Los Adais, uh, a little less than that with Nacogdoches. Um, and there's... Um, well, about 150 miles between San Antonio and Goliad. So, um, and the regions in between are still either the home of indigenous people or because of population loss for various reasons that Todd I'm sure went into yesterday, um, have uh, become um, deserted. And that's something that I would like you to keep in mind that when, um, Sometimes uh, we, the common definition of desert um, is uh, the one we think about in our heads right now is something like the Sahara or the Mojave or, or the Gobi Desert, something that's really dry and, and inhospitable. And one. But desert also had another meaning and it certainly has it in, in Spanish and that is that it's wilderness. It's uninhabited by people and large portions of Texas in this area were uninhabited by people. They might be, they might have been given as ranch lands to individuals and whatnot, but by and large, people didn't live there. The cattle did, and then you went out and got the cattle and brought it back. So the geography of Northern Mexico um, is, is vast. Um, it's 
uh, not very well understood at that time. As you can see from this map, the lines are wrong. But there are some clear understanding of what is where. And the important thing I want to uh, point out right now is that um, if you look on this map, you will notice that the word Coahuila extends beyond the Rio Grande and that the word Tamaulipas extends beyond the Rio Grande. And so one important thing to remember is that Tejanos, the Mexican Texans of Texas, and I'll talk about what, where Tejano came from in a minute. Tejanos saw themselves as inhabitants of the three areas that I've just been talking about, San Antonio, La Bahia Goliad, and Nacogdoches. And they saw the boundaries between Texas and other jurisdictions as the Nueces River and the Medina River. And to the west, this great unpopulated area that was still the home of uh, indigenous people who were completely autonomous. Um, and they had virtually no contact with New Mexico, uh, with Paso del Norte. Uh, most of their contacts, regular contacts, were to the, the south, to Laredo, which was part of the state of, of Tamaulipas, um, and to the interior, and Paso de, uh, and to um, San Juan Bautista del Rio Grande, which you can see over here uh, to, the, to the west of Laredo, and then into the interior from there. All right, to the east, the people around Nacogdoches had extensive contacts into Louisiana, to Natchitoches, and, and uh, so the world of, of the Tejanos is essentially a northeastern Mexican world and a Louisiana world. And so that, those are their frames of reference, all right? Oops, there we go. Um, so here then, uh, defining the, the three population centers, um, one, San Antonio. Let's start with that one because it's the one that's in most continuous settlement. By 1835, by the end of the colonial period, um, it is still a hamlet, really, of all, all maybe 2,500 people at the most. It is centered in what is today the area between the uh, Mercado. Those of you who've been to San Antonio and visited the touristy part of downtown, the Riverwalk area. The Riverwalk area actually really defines what was um, Mexican San Antonio. Um, and then to the east, um, if you cross the street from the Wyatt, the Hyatt, and you and you go toward the Alamo, that area in there was the area that was uh, part of the lands of Mission San Antonio de Valero, what became the Alamo, and then to the south of that, La Villita. So it's a rather small place. To the south were agricultural fields. To the north were agricultural fields. To the west was a small neighborhood on where today the um, the Mercado and uh, Santa Rosa Hospital are that area in there, um, and then to the and to the west of that was uh, again um, just uh, essentially open open country. So a very small place. Nevertheless, the most significant place um, for Tejanos. It is the um, if you will, it is the center of gravity of Mexican Texas. Um, it, um, it had been the capital of Texas from 1773 all the way up to um, 1824 when uh, Texas was joined to Coahuila and the capital moved to uh, Saltillo, which is another story. Um, and so it was the economic center, it was the political center, and it was the, edu and it was the population center. Because to the, to the east, at La Bahia, and again, here we have a, um, an 1829, 1830 view of the place. It's just rolling country with uh, the Presidio and uh, the, the small settlement of a few hundred people living around the Presidio, and then what, um, what remains of the mission activities. Uh, uh, missions on um, um, uh, Mission La Bahia, um, Refugio Mission to the south, um, Rosario has been abandoned by this time. Um, so it's just a few hundred people with uh, a few Indian families left. Um, it's really a military community um, that has ranchers living in the, in the immediate outskirts. And then to the east, 
Um, you, we've got, um, and I, I chose this photograph because it's, it's one of the last photographs of uh, one of the most prominent buildings of, of uh, early Texas. Um, and it was in Nacogdoches. It, it was known as the Stone Fort. It had, already, it had originally been built in the early 1780s. Uh, it actually survived um, into the 20th century and is now and has been reconstructed on the campus of Stephen F. Austin um, University. Uh, there in, in Nacogdoches. Um, but it, um, it represented the place um, from which um, the Tejanos of uh, East Texas uh, dealt with um, a very peculiar situation of being on multiple borders. They were on the border with Louisiana, where by contraband, um, by uh, effort to um, uh, to make do in their ultimate isolation, because they were the uh, they were totally isolated from the rest of of um, uh, Spanish and Mexican uh, Mexico. Uh, they had to deal with the um, the people of Louisiana, and they also had to deal with the Indians. So the House of um, uh, the Indian Agents. Um, Bar and Davenport, they ran their operations out of this building and, and they dealt with the Indians of the, and I'm sure uh, Todd went through this yesterday, so I won't uh, belabor it. The point is that the world of, uh, th this world of uh, Texas, the one thing that it has in common, all three of these settlements have in common, is an almost daily need to deal with indigenous people. Um, the exposure to either hostilities um, or the, in the case of La Bahia and San Antonio to um, indigenous groups that had been brought into the mi uh, missions and had not fully acculturated, but were in a kind of a transition into the mestizo world of Mexico um, are going on in, in Texas. And, and that defines um, who the people are in terms of, of, of where they live. There are other places that are nearby uh, that are not part of Texas and won't be part of Texas until 1848, which makes telling the story of Mexican Texas kind of tricky because if we're gonna focus on political issues um, and we're gonna uh, focus on the relationship with uh, Coahuila and whatnot, um, these places are not part of the story. Um, the, the, and the people in these places not only don't consider themselves Tejanos, they, they, have, they really are um, an entirely uh, separate um, group than, um, than, the, um, than the Tejanos themselves. And what we have is um, El Paso, which was part of New Mexico, uh, was called Paso del Norte. That, that part that was south of the river is now Juarez, Mexico. And the people that lived in that area on both sides of the, of the river um, were New Mexicans until the Mexican Congress separated um, El Paso or Paso del Norte and gave it to Chihuahua. Um, and so they have almost, I haven't, let me put it this way. I've never seen a document in the Bear Ar Archives that talked about a Tejano visiting Paso del Norte or anybody from Paso del Norte visiting San Antonio. All right. That's not the case with Albuquerque. We have a couple of contacts in that direction up there. We don't need to get into it uh, for the, our purposes today. But there is almost no contact with that, those far western settlements. To the south, there is more contact. There's, uh, there's contact with, uh, through Laredo um, and through uh, San Juan Bautista del Rio Grande, there's contacts into the interior of Mexico. None of the, neither of those communities, which are on the Rio Grande, are part of Texas. So the people of Laredo don't see themselves as Tejanos. The people of the lower valley, who in beginning in the 1750s, begin to establish um, farming and ranching operations north of the Rio Grande, between the Rio Grande and the Nueces River, all of that region, all of those people view themselves as part of, in the colonial period, Nuevo Santander, and then later on as part of Tamaulipas when the name changes. And the jurisdictions, as you can see, the towns 
except for Laredo itself, they're all on the south bank of the Rio Grande. Uh, the original Laredo's on the north bank. And in 1848, when, um, when the uh, United States gains ultimate jurisdiction through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and Texas takes over, um, the people of Laredo who weren't happy about becoming Americans, and if you can believe it, there are people who weren't happy about becoming Americans, uh, they set up shop right across the street. So Nuevo Laredo is actually younger than, than Laredo in, in the case of, uh, uh, of that area. And, but the, there is a symbiotic relationship between the two communities that has only of late been uh, severely disrupted uh, by the policies of the respective uh, capitals of the two countries. But nevertheless, my point is here that we are t talking, um, we have to include uh, some mention of them in the story that we're telling, but we shouldn't confuse these people with Tejanos. In, in the 1820s and early 1830s, they would not consider themselves Texans. They weren't Texans, they didn't identify as Texans. Texas and Texans, um, Tejanos, uh, lived north of the Nueces and the Medina River, all right? So, and so um, that brings us to um, the conversion of Spanish colonial people to Mexicans. Um, and I'd like to bring up a point here that I think students should understand is that um, borders keep crossing these people. These people are not crossing the borders. Um, in other words, they're part of this big worldwide empire, the Spanish empire. Spain still controls the Philippines. It still has interests in South America. Uh, it's under assault from the forces of independence throughout the region. And in 1821, gain, Mexico gains its independence. And all of a sudden, uh, Tejanos are no longer Spanish colonial subjects. Um, they are now Mexican citizens. Um, and uh, they um, were reluctant Mexican citizens in a way because they had been burned. In 1811 and in 1812, 1813, there were two episodes, uh, very important episodes of the Mexican War of Independence in Texas. In 1811, a retired military officer in San Antonio um, actually uh, overthrew the Royalist government uh, he was himself overthrown in a, after a couple of months. And then in 1812, 1813, uh, a man named Gutierrez de Lara um, with a, a, a West Point graduate named Augustus McGee lead an invading force into Texas. They capture the province. They declare uh, Mexican independence in Texas in uh, April of 1813, but they are defeated in August of 1813 at the Battle of Medina, which is the largest battle ever fought on Texas soil, uh, and nobody knows very much about it, if anything, um, down uh, southwest of, of San Antonio. Um, and um, as a result of that, the rest of the 18 teens, uh, Texans, uh, the Tejanos are just trying to survive. So that when in the summer of 1821, word arrives, and, and I'm sure that um, Wolf Fowler will go over this in, in more detail tomorrow, when word arrives uh, that there's this thing called the Plan of Iguala, and there, uh, there's this man named um, Iturbide who is um, changed sides. He was a, Mexi a, a royalist officer. Now he's, he's siding with independence, he's, um, and he's gathered uh, this momentum for independence in Mexico that's unstoppable, the people in San Antonio are going, well, okay, we'll just wait and see what happens. So they actually don't accept the plan of Iguala until uh, July of, of 1821, and they do so reluctantly because they have suffered a lot. There's been significant destruction, and destruction will actually play um, a big role in how they view their world and what needs to happen in, in the years to come. So, um, Tejanos and the, uh, the Mexican problem. Um, you heard uh, Todd talk yesterday about um, uh, the indigenous peoples of the region. Uh, and let me just say, those of you who've had a chance to look at the document that we'll be using this afternoon, 
uh, oh, not this afternoon, but later this morning, um, you you probably noticed in it that uh, the Tejanos um, don't have very much nice to say about indigenous people. Um, and that was because, um, and again, this is something that's important to deal with with your students about. They, uh, those people did not have the sensibilities that we do. And from their perspective, from the Tejano perspective, um, the uh, Indians were in the way of progress. Um, Indians who did not accept the trappings of civilization um, that Spanish Mexican civilization that had developed over 300 years of the colonial experience, um, which included uh, mestizaje, which included miscegenation, which included the, the demographic transformation of the Mexican people into a combination of European and Indian and African bloodlines that had combined to create um, a very interesting uh, mixed race people. Um, and, and with a Western European attitude in some respects. And one of those respects was that indigenous people stood in the way of progress. Um, indigenous people were the enemy. In, uh, indigenous people who did not accept the sovereignty of Mexico, um, who did not um, transform themselves into uh, good citizens, um, had to be dealt with severely. Um, and it is a, a perspective that is in fact shared with the Anglo-American settlers, and as we'll, we'll talk about it in the document a bit more. So um, the irony is, of course, that in, in much of the population that is uh, Tejano, is Mexican Texan, um, the, um, the, the, um, there is a considerable amount of uh, Indian blood circulating in it. But these are Indians who have accepted being Mexican. Um, they, have, they had previously accepted being Spanish subjects. They had acculturated, they had moved away from uh, identifying themselves um, with the uh, autonomous indigenous groups that, that survived. And so um, the point here is that uh, from the perspective of Tejanos, um, Indians aren't an opportunity, um, Indians are a problem. Uh, they are a problem uh, in, and, and they are a twofold problem. They are a problem if they are Comanches and Apaches because they tend to raid and they take um, resources that uh, the Tejanos need to support the meager economy that they have. Um, and by the way, they also not only take uh, livestock, um, they not only take produce, uh, they sometimes also take women and children and leave dead people behind. Um, so there's an element of violence that is endemic to the Tejano experience, and, and they see um, this violence mostly in terms of the indigenous peoples um, who have not been brought under submission, uh, particularly Comanches, uh, Apaches, um, and um, other um, people that um, for a long time were called the Norteños, the people of the North, um, who remain autonomous um, who remain beyond the reach of uh, Spanish, um, Spanish law, uh, Spanish military, and then in the Mexican period, um, there's a continuity of that. Uh, the Mexican government, um, from the Tejano perspective, is failing them because it is an, unable to deal effectively with this uh, Native American uh, challenge. So for Tejanos, the mindset is Indians are a Problem. They don't, even though they have, many of them have Indian blood, they don't identify with, with those uh, Indians. A second big problem that Tejanos have uh, coming into independence, um, and one that is not easily resolved um, because of the unsurmountable, at that period of time, um, natural obstacles, uh, is the remoteness from markets. Um, the Spanish crown 
had uh, treated the uh, had treated Texas as a barrier, had treated Texas as a kind of a minefield. Um, if foreigners wanted to get to the valuable parts of Mexico, uh, the silver mines of the north and the population centers that might be uh, good markets for, for goods and whatnot, they would have to get through the minefield that was Texas. So the Spanish government had never had much of an interest in, in doing much with Texas that didn't happen naturally. And since there were very few resources um, to uh, exploit and the population centers were isolated and whatnot, there just hadn't been a lot of uh, pull factors uh, for Texas. And therefore, the economic development uh, of Texas was, was marginal because there weren't internal markets, uh, large internal markets, and the external markets in the interior of Mexico were really far away. And Texas did not have any products that other parts of Mexico weren't producing. Tejanos grew corn. Well, corn, you can find corn every single part of Mexico. Um, Tejanos had cattle and sheep and whatnot. And again, uh, there were these massive haciendas in, in Coahuila and Chihuahua and, and uh, Nuevo León and whatnot uh, that were producing um, livestock uh, for the Mexican domestic market and even for international trade of products um, that were much closer to the population centers, to the interior of Mexico. And so Tejanos were always on on the margins of, of, of all of the economic development that was Mexico. And so consequently, um, it had it, the, the little economic development that uh, existed in Texas was tied to the garrisons, the garrison payrolls at La Bahia and, um, and San Antonio um, were um, principal sources of income for Tejanos so that a few farmers who could raise something beyond subsistence crops could sell to those markets. Um, and some ranchers actually could then take cattle into the interior uh, of Mexico uh, because the nice thing about cattle uh, is that it moves itself, right? Um, so you, you actually, your merchandise is getting to market on its own, uh, but it's expensive, it's difficult, it's uh, burdened with risks, drought and flooding alternated, uh, making uh, ranching, uh, even ranching an iffy proposition. So all of this means that not only are Tejanos isolated in terms of, of demographics and distance, they're also isolated economically because their opportunities to engage with Mexican markets is very limited and the, the increasingly lucrative market on the other side of the border with what is now the United States um, is um, short-circuited by, previously had been short-circuited by, by Spanish commercial policy, which prohibited trade with Louisiana. And by the 1820s, uh, by the, the, again, the fact that the majority of the Tejano population lives in the San Antonio Goliad area, and uh, taking uh, produce to market in the interior of uh, Louisiana and so forth is, um, is difficult and has been replaced. And here's something where we need to do more work. There, a little bit of work has been done on it is the Indians themselves are actually supplying the one thing that is in great demand in, the, in what was then the Western United States, the United States west of the Mississippi River, and that is horses and mules. So Texas horses and mules are getting to Louisiana and Arkansas and Missouri and whatnot, but they're not getting there through a lot of the time through the activities of Tejanos. They're getting there through the activities of um, the Indians of the area. And, um, and so the last mention here is the absence of attractions. And that is there's no gold, there's no silver, um, all of the waterways are running in the wrong direction. Um, there is no, there are no pull factors. There aren't any resources that are attracting population. Um, so very few people 
in the 1820s uh, from the interior of Mexico. And as, you'll see, as we'll talk about later in the document, uh, the Tejanos themselves are pointing out that Mexican policy is kind of repeating Spanish policy and is actually putting up roadblocks to the, the demographic development of Texas, which might deal with the two other problems. The problem of, of uh, the Indians. If you get more people there, you can better control the Indians. And if you get more people there, you can create economic opportunity and create markets um, that um, are now non-existent. So for, for these reasons, the Tejanos see themselves as, as uh, plagued by uh, problems that come from the colonial period. And so for them, the American problem, the American, uh, the, the answer is Anglo-American uh, migration. Um, and um, we'll talk more about in the document session, um, but Tejanos are familiar with Anglo-American frontier economic activity. They are, um, many of them had um, been into the United States, had been to Louisiana, uh, people like Jose Francisco Ruiz, uh, who was one of the uh, self-exiles there. He had to flee during the Mexican War of Independence at the end of the Gutierrez McGee expedition. Uh, he had sided with the rebels, so he flees to the United States, and he's living on the border between Louisiana and Texas, um, trying to um, uh, escape uh, the Spanish were trying to capture him, but he gets to know the Americans and he gets to know how the Americans operate. Um, and he, he's familiar with the plantations. He's familiar with, with cotton agriculture. He's familiar with, with slavery. Um, he's familiar with all of these things and he sees in them the opportunity uh, for growth. Um, Tejanos in uh, national uh, politics, um, obviously, um, the, in 1821, there are very few Anglo-Americans. Uh, they are still relative, they are still the minority. Anglo-Americans are still the minority in 1824 and 1827, uh, when uh, Texas's relationship to the rest of Mexico uh, is being ironed out. And it gets ironed out based on the fact that Texas is this huge place, but is relatively unsettled because the Indians don't count. Um, so what to do with this very vast region that has very few people in it? And there, there would have been two choices. There would have been the choice of making Texas a, a national territory like New Mexico and California were, in which case governors and the government would actually come out of Mexico City or figure out a way of making Texas uh, part of a, of a state that would be autonomous. Um, and the problem there is that originally the idea had been to create one super state out of what is now Tamaulipas and Nuevo Leon and Coahuila and Texas. But Tamaulipas and Nuevo Leon bowed out. They wanted to be states on their own and they had enough population and they had enough economic activity to be states on their own. So um, Congress accepts them as separate states and that leaves Coahuila to join up with Texas. They are both underpopulated, but Coahuila has about uh, 10 times or more people than, than Texas. So it actually could have been a state on its own, but it sees opportunity in joining up with Texas. So Texas and Coahuila join together and in, um, by act of Congress, not a, an act that was done uh, at the behest of the people in Coahuila and Texas themselves, but was actually done in Mexico City during the, the Constituent Congress. And in the spring of uh, 1824, the Union of Coahuila and Texas leads then to um, Texas losing status because San Antonio is no longer the capital. Uh, the capital is transferred to Saltillo. The legislature meets down there. Uh, Texas at the beginning only has, one, because of its small population, uh, only has one representative in the, in the new Congress. Um, and it has to rely on the fact that there are other representatives who want to keep as much authority in the hands of local people as possible. Um, and to do that, uh, they, um, they, they, they side or they develop 
their philosophy of being federalists, that as much power as possible should be in the hands of the state and in turn should be in the hands of, of local people. So the union of, of uh, Coahuila and Texas means a loss of autonomy for Texas, which Texans, both Anglo and Tejanos, are going to be trying to claw back between 1840, 1824 and 1835, the Tejanos are, are going to be trying to get back to as much power as they could. I'm really running over. I'm sorry. Um, there's just a lot. To, uh, I'll talk very quickly about life in, uh, in Texas. I've already mentioned some of these things. Um, it's a corn-based economy uh, and a subsistence one, by and large. Um, so there's a little bit of trade that uh, the Tejanos of uh, San Antonio and Goliad in particular carry on with their Anglo-American neighbors uh, mostly, but uh, the only products that are taken into the interior of Mexico, legal products that is, um, are cattle. Uh, and that kind of dries up during this period of time too. Um, it is an equestrian society. Um, so, uh, obviously, because of the distances involved and because of the nature of the terrain, a lot of the, uh, both, uh, of the economic activity um, is done from horseback um, and, or uh, by pack mule. Uh, the roads are rudimentary. Uh, they're not, the Camino Real has a grand name, but it's, it's really just ruts. Uh, that have been followed, uh, have been carved into the landscape over generations of um, travel, mostly by mules, although for some distances by cart. Um, but it is, an it is an essentially equestrian uh, society. It is the roots, really, of the American Western experience in terms of a lot of the uh, ways that um, uh, cattle are handled, uh, horsemanship, uh, even the, even what we call the Western saddle is a modification of the of the Spanish Mexican working saddle, um, and uh, Spanish Mexican customs have been modified. Uh, there's reports of people saying that the people of the the Tejanos, the the Mexicans of Texas, are are more American than anything else, and that is because they've been influenced by activities with with Louisiana. So, uh, but nevertheless, um, they are Catholic. Um, they are Spanish speaking. Um, they are a, um, uh, their music um, and their um, recreational activities uh, harken back to the 300 years of the, of the Spanish experience. Um, and their holidays are um, Mexican Independence Day. Uh, September 16, which have developed by 1825, 1826, Tejanos are, are celebrating uh, Mexican Independence Day. Um, the big celebrations of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe in December um, draw large crowds from the countryside and whatnot. So they, uh, and of course, many Tejanos have family in Coahuila and in Nuevo León and in Tamaulipas. Um, and so the ties that bind the Tejanos of the Victoria and the Goliad area, of the Martin de Leon colony and whatnot, and, and of the San Antonio people themselves, all of them have ties to the interior of Mexico, which means that Spanish Mexican custom um, is, is the way that they see the world. Uh, they may have been influenced in their dress a little bit and their music and whatnot by, uh, by Anglo-America. But by and large, they remain uh, they remain Mexican. Um, so um, Texas federalism and the Texas cause, and I'm not going to get into the revolution. I know that that Andrew's going to go, but I just want to mention a few things. There are prominent Tejanos during this period of time beyond the couple of people mentioned in the Teaks. Uh, Juan Martin Beramendi. We don't have a portrait of him, uh, but we do have pictures of what his um, his uh, estate in San Antonio looked like. And in fact, it was called the Benamendi Palace. It was a large uh, stone structure that dated back to uh, Juan's father, uh, Fernando Benamendi, who had built it in the 1770s. And it was still up in the early 20th century. Uh, so this photograph around the turn of the century. Uh, and it, uh, anyway, Martin de, uh, Juan Martin Benamendi actually becomes the vice governor of uh, Coahuila and with the death of the governor, he assumes the governorship until he himself dies in the cholera epidemic. So he, um, his daughter, 
Ursula Beramendi is married to um, uh, uh, David, uh, David, to uh, Jim Bowie. Um, and um, so he has, uh, Beramendi has very powerful economic links, both in Coahuila and in the Anglo-American community. The same can be said of uh, Jose Francisco Ruiz. Uh, very, he's got a brand new book. I'll talk about it during the document se uh, session. Uh, the first full biography of Jose Francisco Ruiz, who's a military officer. He was an Indian agent. He had been to Mexico City with the Comanches to try to talk the uh, um, government into forming a lasting alliance with the Comanches. He'd been a school teacher, um, a very, very prominent individual who we don't know a lot about because, again, um, Anglo-Americans just weren't important to the way Texas history was written. And um, even though the documentation is, is there to write the stories of a lot of these men, uh, it just doesn't happen be, or didn't happen because they just weren't important. The um, Jose Antonio Navarro, uh, another signer of the Texas Declaration of Independence, a partner of, um, of Stephen F. Austin and a very important uh, consultant to the Anglo-Americans in developing their strategies for dealing with the, the government in Saltillo and in Monclova um, is uh, tremendously important uh, for understanding uh, the Tejano experience of this period. And uh, Erasmo and Juan Seguin, and here's uh, Juan, um, the, the son who is the most prominent Military, Tejano military figure during the revolution, but his father was actually the one who negotiated the relationship between Coahuila and Texas. Uh, he was the representative of Texas at the Constituent Congress of 1823-1824. Uh, and so I am going to stop there. Um, and. Uh,